some of my past videos, I've said things like, what if there's nothing wrong with you? Talking to the people who have complex PTSD, anxiety, depression. There's an article I'm going to share with you here today, and it's, it's really, really interesting. It's kind of asking some major, major questions. It's about a piece of research that's been published daily about how we think about mental illness at all. And it's challenging researchers to think differently about mental illness. And I want to share it with you because there's some really, really important points that they make in this. What if we're thinking about mental illness in entirely the wrong way? And what if the way we're thinking about it is kind of making people feel like there's something wrong with them? When, what if it isn't the case? What if there's other reasons, not just some sort of a, maybe a biological flaw or a, like the disease model we're, we're talking about and that has been relied on? This is an article from Forbes magazine and it says researchers doubt that certain mental disorders are disorders at all. Now they're talking about a piece of research. Um, it, it, the, the name of the research article is called Mental Health is Biological Health. Why tackling disease of the mind is an imperative for biological anthropology in the 21st century. But the Forbes article kind of breaks it down and I'm going to share it with you here. And I'm going to read through it and um, I'm going to kind of maybe talk about what I found really interesting in it. But what we're talking about here is, is this model we have at the moment actually helpful at all? So it starts off, it says, what if mental disorders like anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder aren't mental disorders at all? In a compelling new paper, biological anthropologists call on the scientific community to rethink mental illness. With a thorough review of the evidence, they show good reasons to think of depression or PTSD as responses to adversity rather than chemical imbalances. Responses to adversity. This is along the line of thinking of maybe we're thinking about it wrong if we're talking about it being this chemical imbalance as a sort of a catch-all explanation for mental health problems. Maybe there's more to it and maybe we need to be focusing way more on the adversity. Maybe it's a sort of an issue, societal issue, or the way society is organized and uh, the uh, adversity that comes with that. And ADHD could be a way of functioning that evolved in an ancestral environment, but doesn't match the way we live today. So think about students in schools who are given this, this uh, label of ADHD, like there's something wrong with the student, what if it's something else that's taking place? Adverse responses to adversity. Mental disorders are routinely treated, treated by medication under the medical model. So the medical model is that, that chemical imbalance. So why are the anthropologists who wrote this study claiming that these disorders might not be medical at all? They point to a few key points. First, that medical science has never been able to prove that anxiety, depression, or PTSD are inherited conditions. There's no good evidence for that, okay? And that's a big, big argument against the biological explanation, the purely biological explanation for that. Because we know in terms of other diseases or, or, or um, physical problems that there is an, uh, a heritability factor. That's easy to prove, or it has been proven. Not so with these mental disorders, uh, mental health, health disorders. Second, the study authors note that despite widespread and increasing use of antidepressants, rates of anxiety and depression do not seem to be improving. Okay? So from 1990 to 2010, the global prevalence of major depressive disorder and anxiety disorders held at 44 and 4%. At the same time, evidence has continued to show that antidepressants perform no better than placebo. That's a big sort of a negative for the explanation, the purely chemical imbalance. If it was about chemical imbalances, all these uh, prescriptions for anti antidepressants, for instance, would be making an impact. It isn't. It's not changing it. Okay. Now, I'm not arguing here, by the way, that there's no such thing as chemical imbalance. My point has actually been more about, okay, let's say there is even a chemical imbalance. Well, what is the trigger for that? Is there something problematic in the person that makes that happen? Or is it this more adversity thing? Is it challenges in a person's life that make this chemical imbalance tend to come about? 
But anyway, they're saying here in this article that, or in this research, that it actually hasn't helped these conditions all that much. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, personally, from my point of view, that it's helped no one. I've talked to many people who have said it is helpful for them. But overall here, this study is suggesting that this, the way of thinking about mental health as purely chemical imbalance is maybe not the best way to think about it. Third, worldwide rates of these disorders remain stable at one in 14 people, yet in conflict affected countries, okay, where there's a lot of maybe PTSD uh, possibilities for that, an estimated one in five suffers from depression, PTSD, anxiety, and other disorders. So it's way higher in places where these uh, challenges people will face or adversity uh, is more likely to happen. So taken together, the authors posit that anxiety, depression, and PTSD may be adaptive responses to adversity. Adaptive. In other words, like I've been saying in some videos, what if there's nothing wrong with you? What if the way your nervous system is responding is exactly the way it's supposed to be responding and these responses are actually healthy responses? Okay, that anxiety you feel is a healthy response for a sensitive human being in a uh, less than ideal environment. Defense systems are adaptations that reliably activate in fitness threatening situations in order to minimize fitness loss, they write. It's not hard to see how that could be true for anxiety. Worry helps us avoid danger. Again, as I've been saying this too, the nervous system, although it can seem excessive and frustrating for us sometimes when we have this anxiety or, or excessive worry. It's actually trying to keep us safe. It's the nervous system trying to do its job. Our job is to calm it down, really. And, but how can that be true for depression? We can see how anxiety is working there, but what about depression? They argue that the psychic pain of depression helps us focus attention on adverse events so as to mitigate the current adversity and avoid future such adversities, same thing, okay? Sometimes we have that hopelessness feeling uh, or helplessness feeling with depression. And again, it's that the voice of the, of the nervous system or as I refer to it as the inner critic, it's basically telling us don't move. It's, it's kind of like that freeze response in the fight, flight or freeze. It's your nervous system is actually operating properly, believe it or not. So if that sounds unlikely, then consider that neuroscientists have increasingly mapped these three disorders to branches of the threat detection system, the nervous system. Safety is its number one job. Anxiety may be due to chronic activation of the fight or flight system. PTSD may occur when trauma triggers the freeze response, which helps animals disconnect from pain before they die. And depression may be a chronic activation of that same freeze response. So PTSD and depression are things like stop don't freeze okay don't go in there don't go back to that situation it's hopeless right that's what happens so the article here it says labels the way we're thinking about this labels matter our explanation for mental health has a huge huge uh, impact on how we how we deal with it so labels are something we internalize to defend or sure, to define who we are and what we are capable of all too often labels limit us. And that's why reconsidering how we label anxiety, depression, or ADHD is important. Does someone have depression, a medical disorder of the brain, or are they having a depressed adaptive response to the adversity? So maybe it's not this disorder of the brain at all. Maybe it's an adaptive response to adversity. Adversity is something we can overcome, whereas a mental disorder is something to be managed. The labels imply very different possibilities, okay? So if it is this adversity, we work on improving the environment and calming the nervous system to accept that the, nerve, the environment has changed because the nervous system takes some convincing about that, even if things have improved. So that's really, really important to, uh, to keep in mind. Consider how we label ADHD. A generation ago, boys with ADHD were labeled as bad boys and were given penalties or detentions. Now we help kids with ADHD understand that they are having a learning difference. Instead of detention, we try to provide support in a variety of modalities. 
And when we do, the behavior problems often disappear. The label change to learning difference is vital because it gives space for kids with ADHD to be good kids and to succeed. Yet ADHD is still attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Okay, so you change the environment, you change the label, you change the way the, the condition or the experience is framed and it has a big, big impact on behavior. But yet it's still considered a disorder. What if it's more about adverse environment? What if like it's about a, an environment that uh, certain people can't adapt to? and shouldn't be made adapt to. In Finland, where substantial physical activity is part of the school day, rates of ADHD are very low. Meanwhile, in the US, children are asked to sit still for the majority of the day, and this is the case in Europe as well. Um, elementary school students often get only 15 to 20 minutes of recess a day, a far cry from the 60 to 90 minutes their parents had. Massive change, in the environment. For children, maybe an adversity added to their environment, more adversity. Kids want to be social, kids want to move, kids want to play. That's all they want to do, pretty much. Coincidentally, ADHD rates in the US have gone up over the past 15 years. And they're saying here, maybe that's not a coincidence. Maybe it's not just this chemical imbalances have come out of nowhere. Maybe things have changed in the environment. ADHD is not a disorder, the study authors argue. Rather, it is an evolutionary mismatch to the modern learning environment we have constructed. Edward Hagen, professor of evolutionary anthropology at uh, Washington State University and co-author of the study, pointed out in a press release that there is little in our evolutionary history that accounts for children sitting at a desk at desks quietly while watching a teacher do maths equation on a board. What if kids aren't designed for this? And what if this old model of education where the kid comes in and sits there for 45 minutes or an hour watching an adult explain something esoteric that may not apply to their lives and limiting the amount of movement and, and social interaction they can have. What if, what if many kids aren't designed for that and a certain amount of those kids can't adapt to that and we're forcing them to adapt and if they can't, we give them this thing called a disorder something to think about. If ADHD is not a disorder, but a mismatch with a human environment, then suddenly it's not a medical issue. It's an issue for educational reform. Now we're getting into political stuff, okay? And, you know, that's gonna take a long time, but for, on a personal level, the main reason I'm making this video is Realize this about yourself or someone that you love. Maybe there's nothing wrong with the person. Maybe it's just adversity in the environment. That's a compelling thought given the evidence that kids focus uh, and cognition are improved by physical activity. Still, we need to take this study with a grain of salt. There's a large body of research showing other biological factors when it comes to ADHD. For instance, there is evidence that premature birth increases rates of ADHD later. So again, there's this label of ADHD there. And I think there's nothing wrong with that caveat there. Keep that in mind. But again, that's just, to my mind, that's another way of saying, okay, there's this one size fits all environment for young people in schools. And some will be more sensitive and not able to adapt to that as others. And maybe there's factors that go into that. But the issue here is, should we be trying to get children to adapt, every child to adapt to the same environment? Maybe they're not supposed to. Social reform or medical treatment. So study author uh, Kristen Saimi, a recent uh, PhD graduate from WSU, compares treating anxiety, depression, or PTSD with antidepressants to medicating someone for a broken bone without setting the bone itself, right? You gotta get the basics right first. Look at the adversity in the environment. Start to ask some questions about that. She believes that these problems look more like socio-cultural phenomena. So the solution is not necessarily fixing a dysfunction in the person's brain, but fixing dysfunctions in the social world. It's a fair criticism of the way we treat mental illness, but the stated goal of the paper is not to suddenly 
change treatments, but to explore new ways of studying these problems. Research on depression, anxiety, and PTSD should put greater emphasis on mitigating conflict and diversity and less on manipulating brain chemistry. And that's not a bad word there, I think, manipulating it. Of course, it, some people will say it's helped them, and okay, it helps people sometimes. But there is this thing when changing the levels of medication, and there's not really that much science behind that. It's more of an experimental thing. So it's, you could use that word manipulation of brain chemistry. But what about the fact that there's plenty of medical evidence for that, uh, for that brain chemistry? Consider a recent study done in Turku, Finland. Researchers showed that the symptoms associated with depression and anxiety are connected to changes in the brain's opioid system already in healthy individuals. Can we reconcile brain studies like this with the biological anthropologist's criticism of how we handle mental health? Actually, it says we can. The changes in the brain associated with anxiety and depression are evident, but that doesn't mean that they can't be understood as responses to adversity. Based on this, we need to make changes in how we treat mental health. Or do we need to change it? Yes and no, it says here. When it comes to what labels we use, a change is welcome, and I agree with that. Mental health recovery is par in part depends on whether patients believe they can get better. Telling our patients that their symptoms may be tied to a healthy response to adversity could be very encouraging. And that's really the point I'm making in this video. Again, what if there's nothing wrong with you if you have PTSD or anxiety or depression? What if it is way more to do with the adversity you faced and your body hasn't betrayed you, your body isn't letting you down, it's actually acting the way it's supposed to be. And it feels very intense and overwhelming and difficult and challenging for us. But to stick a label of dysfunction or disorder on it, what if that's really counter, um, unhelpful, counterproductive? It's not, good new, it's not news to doctors that mental health is impact, impacted by adversity. In my own medical training, this person writes, I was taught the biosociosocial model, biopsychosocial model, implying interconnected causes of these problems. And that's fair, okay? I'm not saying either that there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance for anyone. But we need to consider all of these factors and look at, for the majority of people, what may be happening. But until social reform actually does remove uh, social causes of suffering, which you know we're going to be waiting a while for that one, physicians must continue to provide the standard of care to our patients. And the history of medicine is a story of healers using the best treatments that they had at the time until better ones arrive. So very interesting paper there, very interesting article written about the paper. What I want you to take from this is to really question the assumption that if you're going through anxiety, depression, PTSD, or complex PTSD, that there's something wrong with you, that your body has let you down, that your body, your body is broken or you're defective. If you've got burnout, for instance, is another great example, is there something wrong with you? What if there's maybe, for instance, boundaries with certain things in your environment need to be put in place? And it's not that your body is having a, a, a experiencing a disorder, it's your body is sending you signals that we could do, we do well maybe to not label the disorder and to start listen to and start to reconcile with. So really interesting article, I hope that was helpful. If you have any feedback on this or thoughts on it yourself, you can comment below. And I um, hope it was good and um, I'll talk to you guys again soon.